D four five. You see this in the literature too. Uh, this this name K D four five. Now you see that sometimes there's actually some sense behind these names, right? Because they actually tell you what is assumed, right? Okay, this is, now you can actually read it off. You can just lump them together because whenever you add an axiom, you don't make other axioms invalid, right? So it's the class, this, is, um, this characterizes the class, this collection of sentences, these and D, four, five, this, this, and this, right? All these together correspond to all the frames that are serial, transitive, and Euclidean. That is moral basis that are consistent and have this introspective property, are introspective. Um, now, if you add one more thing, if you add T to this, then you get a system that's called S5. And in fact, S5, uh, you, get that, you get S5 with less than that, in fact. K plus T plus 5. And that's the problem. This is called S5, but no one, no one knows. Well, people know why, but it's it's confusing. And these two are the ones that you see most often in the literature on on linguistic applications, on modality. What is S5? Well, uh, what what sets of frames does it characterize? Um, well, ones that have these three properties, reflexive, transitive, and Euclidean. In fact, reflexive and Euclidean implies transitive. Or alternatively, so there are various ways of identifying the same class. Reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So that's the same. It's the same uh, alternative ways of saying the same thing. And S5, so S5, we have the reflexive, transitive, and symmetric relations. It's 11, but uh, just one second. Um, K, D, 4, 5, there we have the um, serial transitive and Euclidean relations. Uh, after the break, I will say two more things or so on these, and then we'll move on to process ordering sources. Or should I just finish this off and move the, push the break a little bit into, what do you, what do you think? Could I finish this, say one more thing on this? A relation that has these properties, reflexive, transitive, and symmetric, is um, also called an equivalence relation. equivalence relation. Um, in intuitively, intuitively that means so you have so you see you have your set of worlds and they are all over the place here. Intuitively it means when two worlds stand in a relation that has these properties, they aren't really distinguishable. Uh, so here let's see. Um, In the sense that if you say, so suppose, okay, suppose you say something about uh, some set of, some subset of these worlds, right? Uh, 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 uh. 
if you look at some at some world in here where you have so, you know, uh, 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 leave this in here actually it is impossible with an equivalence relation to have an arrow going somewhere for example to this stop uh, let's call this V without having the same arrow going to V from all the other worlds in here. If, if you have this arrow, then you also need this. You also have to go back and forth and so on. This doesn't perhaps doesn't make a lot of sense right now. Uh, what you, you may not quite see immediately what this, why this is important, what it means. We'll see it tomorrow in, um, when we talk about time and tense and so on. Um, there are certain boundaries here which, which are not crossed. If you have any link between these two, then all the worlds are, must be completely connected. Then basically the boundary breaks down and you have complete connectivity within this. So you have patches of world, as it were, right? patches of these of subsets, within which you have complete connectivity and there's no link across these patches. And if there is one, then you have, you, know, you have to connect them all. So they partition the set of worlds into blocks, right? The equivalence relation does that. Uh, that's actually, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about this. But it, so it's still like, that's, I'm aware of this. Um, it's a sort of a preview for tomorrow when we talk about temporal relations and inter interactions with modality. Okay. Uh, so that's it for now. Let's have a break until 11.20 and uh, we'll meet again. It's a handout of, for day two. Okay, so we will now turn to a very influential paper where these methods that we've been talking about here were um, applied to the analysis of a variety of linguistic expressions. And um, there are some, some modifications that you need to make and in general it's not so clear how all of these things actually apply when you deal with real English sentences, natural language sentences. But to remind ourselves of the way this author, Kratzer here, um, deals with or represents modal basis and so on. Remember that we said before if, you, if phi this uppercase phi, right? If this is a set of sentences, then earlier we already had this once, right? Um, the denotation of such a set is the intersection of all propositions, sets of worlds in there. That is, if you have, you know, if your phi contains all of these sets of worlds, these propositions, then the intersection, which is here, uh, this is this is really the, this is a set of worlds where all of the sentences in phi are true. Okay, and you can always go back and forth between sentences and the proposition state in note, of course. So, and I said that yesterday at one point. So, you know, this, is a, this may be a modal base. We, so far we have been talking about modal bases as sets of worlds that are given by the accessibility relation, right? If you ha have the accessibility relation, you get this set of worlds. She, Kratzer, does it slightly differently namely by saying that from a particular set of worlds 
uh, sorry, from a particular world now of evaluation, say it's here, your W. Uh, you don't go directly to RW, right, which we had here. It's this, this set of worlds, right? What you're actually given, so to speak, is the set of propositions. And that is called F in her terminology. So F of W is a set of propositions. Okay? And the intersection is this. You see that in her paper. Now something like this F, which is a function from worlds to sets of propositions, that's what she calls conversational backgrounds. F is a conversational background. Um, and there are, again, these different kinds of these backgrounds that we talked about in connection with modality. There are epistemic ones, deontic ones, what the law prescribes, and so on. Uh, what you desire, what you fear, all these things, they can uh, form, they, you know, of course, uh, conversational backgrounds, basically lists of sentences or sets of the corresponding propositions. Right. And then each of them can uh, corresponds to a modal base. Right. So that's the, uh, the basic change in perspective that uh, you have to be aware of when you read that paper. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same uh, in here. So you're still dealing with the basic picture where models are interpreted relative to modal bases in terms of uh, you know, non-empty overlap or in inclusion and so on, right, for necessity and uh, possibility. As before. Okay, so, well, if that's the case, and we don't need to repeat everything we've said so far, okay? Uh, there is, however, now an interesting new twist to all of this. Uh, you have, with every modal expression, this modal base, which now is just this, right? It's actually not quite clear to me. I, perhaps if you read the paper very carefully, you'll find out. I haven't, I don't know. Uh, what, what I think what she calls modal base is this intersection. Uh, it's not the f that is the function, but I'm not sure. Actually, we don't, let's not worry about that. Uh, modal base, then we have this modal force, right? Non-empty intersection or set inclusion, consistency or consequence. And then we have this ordering source. And that uh, we need to talk about a little bit. Why she has that, what it does, and why it's useful. It's useful for a lot of things. Um, it's useful and required because these logical notions that involve universal quantification and existential quantification over possible worlds, they are rarely relevant in the analysis of linguistic expressions. Uh, in linguistic, necessity is rarely literal necessity. Uh, usually there are exceptions, and it's a bit weaker than that. It's almost necessary and so on. So we'll see that in a second. Uh, well, in fact, right now, I, well, I'll leave this on as, as long as I can go without deleting. Uh, here, I have a list of six items on page two of this handout uh, of phenomena, things which um, require, or which, in, in where she applies these ordering sources. I don't, I don't want to say they require ordering sources for their analysis because there are other ways of dealing with all of these things. And I don't want to advocate this particular approach um, in the way, not in the sense that this is the only way of analyzing all these phenomena. But it is one way, and it's the most prevalent one in linguistic literature. <coughs> so weak readings of necessity models. I will only briefly 
say what that is and then the next one, and then we'll talk about what ordering sources are, how they are used, and then we'll look at the remaining items here on this list, okay? Uh, these weak readings of necessity models, section 211 there. Um, so the sentences that I have here, this, uh, this is the road to Springfield. And this must be the road to Springfield. Uh, well, the second line here, we call this A and B. The second line involves the word must. And so far we have thought of must as a necessity model, right? So this necessarily is the road to Springfield. Now it depends, of course, again on the model base, what exactly the reading of this is. Uh, but the most plausible interpretation is epistemic, right? With respect to what you know or believe. So for all I know, uh, this must be the road. Springfield, right? Now then, you, there is a problem here because if you say that, you indicate that you're not quite sure. You, in fact, indicate that you're not quite sure. Not only is this statement felicitous or compatible, or you know, you can you can say this if you're not quite sure. In fact, that is what you say. Uh, whereas without the model, that's not the case. For A, you actually know for sure. Right? If you say A, that means you know for sure. Well, but then, uh, so what, what does must then do here? If it's a universal model, how can it possibly be any weaker? Right? The assertion that you make with must be. How can it be weaker than uh, necessity, universal quantification? I mean, what you say in saying I'm not quite sure, it means, uh, you know, I think so, but it's not, you know, it's also possible that I'm wrong, something like that. Now, you can, of course, do two things to address this problem. You could either say that the moral force is a bit weaker than necessity. If you do that, you would probably want to deal with something like probabilities or things like that. Uh, but what what we find in this paper is a different approach. She says, Kratzer says, uh, you, you consider for the interpretation of must, you consider only, only a subset of the modal base. Some of the modal worlds, sorry, some of the worlds in the modal base are relevant for the truth of this sentence, others are not. So you quantify over some, uh, perhaps a proper subset of it. Well, and then of course the question is which ones? And how do you get them, right? Which ones can you ignore? Well, the ones where this is not the road to Springfield, but why? Why are they less relevant? Well, you know, there have to be some reasons for that. And so she wants to give you a principled way of deriving this, of finding out which worlds are relevant for the truth of a moralized statement, which are irrelevant in a certain situation, using these ordering sources. Okay, this is one of the phenomena. Is there anything else I wanted to say about that before we move on? <coughs> no. Except that uh, in Japanese, of course, the models like Hazuda and so on, Ichigai and I, do exactly the same thing, always. You I mean, they look like necessity. It would be hard to say how they differ from necessity models, but they are weaker than that. You have to find some way of addressing that. Uh, the graded modality, of course, is an even more obvious example, where um, you, in fact, can say, you know, that uh, proposition P or some statement like this is sort of Springfield that this is uh, rather unlikely or very likely, it's highly likely, somewhat, 
and so on. So you have all these, you, you can populate this whole space between zero and one, right? Between truth and uh, falsehood and truth. The expressions that refer to all the intermediate points, roughly, they are vague, but they exist, right? How do you analyze those? Obviously, you cannot do that in terms of universal or existential quantification, right? Because there you can only say existential quantification. Well, there is a world such that. And universal, well, there's no world, no counterexample. But uh, how, how can you say something like there are more worlds, or somehow these are, these worlds, whereas the world of Springfield are somehow better or more prominent or more relevant than other ones? Uh, again, so you have to find some way of ranking them. It's very similar to this other problem with must, where after I want to find the, the ones that you care about, here you want to say that some are more relevant than others. Right, so here on uh, section 2.2, the way this is done now here in the system is by saying there are two conversational backgrounds. We have this F. Okay. We have, let me, let's put, so we have F, which gives you the modal base. Right. And then you have something called G, which gives you the ordering source, and both of these are of the same kind. They are both functions from worlds to sets of propositions. Both the same. So you have uh, these ordering sources. There are also epistemic ones or deontic ones, and so on. And these two now work together in ranking the worlds in the modal base. So if your modal base is epistemic, you may still have, within these epistemic possibilities, different kind of sort of um, likelihoods or so. Um, some, you know, the epistemic modal base only tells you what is possible. But you may also know what is likely and what is unlikely. And you can get that with this ordering source. You may also have some opinion about your um, modal base with regard to which worlds are better than others in a moral sense or you know, with regard to some laws or your desires, which are more desirable than others. Yeah, so how, do you, how does it work? Uh, well, it's actually a very simple system. It's really the basic, it's, it's pretty much the, more, the simplest thing you can say here. And there are extensions of this which are a bit more complex, but sticking with this simple case, you establish an order relative to your modal base. Here on the handout, I say some set of sentences, right? Let's, let's do it uh, the way she does it in her paper where she says G of W as the parameter on which the order depends. That's the relation between possible worlds, right? W stands in this relation to Z, two possible worlds, if and only if. And then you have these two clauses. What do they say? Well, the set of propositions in here that are true that Z is a subset of the set of propositions in here that are true at W. Do I have to write this out? It's on the handout, it's in the paper. I think it should be pretty clear. So you have a set of propositions. And you simply compare two worlds by, uh, you know, which, which ones of them are true there. And if W makes all the propositions in your ordering source true that Z makes true, then it's at least as good, or at least as close to being perfect. I'm talking in terms of perfect here. Often you see that uh, people talk about 
the ideal because the, generally these ordering sources are discussed in connection with deontic or Bolitic uh, modal bases or um, readings, that is requirements or desires, so things like that. Uh, so you may have this f of w, which is say here some some set of worlds, and you know it comes from intersecting all the things in um, the model base, all these propositions. And then you have this g of w, which is an entirely different thing. And in fact, there doesn't need to be any overlap. In fact, g g of w may even be inconsistent. That doesn't matter either. Let's assume it is consistent. But let's assume there is no overlap uh, between the interse two intersections. So you know, g, g of w may be something like this here. I don't know. So, uh, Another one here. Okay, three, three propositions. All right, and we have the intersection in here of G of W. That is the set of worlds in which all the laws are upheld or observed, right? Or in which all your desires are fulfilled. The set of perfect worlds, right? So here. Okay. But now you know that you are not in a perfect world. <coughs> For instance, because John crossed the street when the, when the light was red. So already, this is not a perfect world. Something happened that disturbs the uh, perfect order of things. John violated the rule, okay? Now, still, okay, but the rules, they, they stipulate more things than just uh, no one walks um, when the light is red. There are other rules which are upheld. John did not uh, push the old lady off her bicycle when he walked across the street, right? At least uh, he was careful about that. Okay, so he could have done that. That would have been worse. Then we would be in one of these worlds. But we aren't, so here, right? So if we have one, something here like Z, suppose, and then we have a world in here, say, call this, uh, I don't want, well, let's see. Well, V, right. Then one of the propositions in this ordering source is true here, and none of them is true here. Okay. So we have V is better than Z, but Z is not better than V. That's how this, how this comes about. Because the set of propositions in G of W, so no, no, notice what the intersection is doesn't actually matter. It's just the collection of propositions here that is used in deriving this order. So the set of propositions that is true at V, sorry, Z is a subset of the set of propositions that are true at Z. So we have perhaps here um, P, Q, and R, and so at Z, um, the set of propositions, uh, I have to use phi now because I, I used P as a name here for this, so phi is such that phi is in G of W and Z is in phi. This is indeed a subset of propositions such that blah 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 and v isn't five, right? Because this is zero, 
the empty set, and this contains p, right? And therefore, also, it doesn't go the other way here. They don't stand in the reverse relation. And then down here we have worlds here, maybe uh, y, say, world y, where two of these propositions are true. That's even better, right? So we also have z, uh, sorry, y. y is better than b, and y is also better than z but z is not better than y, and so on, okay? Perhaps I should have left a little room here. Let me put these, these in as well, just so uh, you see what the properties of this, of this ordering relation are. There are also worlds in here, x, right? And we may also wonder what's the relationship between y and x. Um, so at x, the this set, right, of propositions in the ordering source that is true at x is a oh, q, right? For v, it was just p. For y, it was both q and p. And for z, it was nothing. Okay. So, according, so if, if the if the order relation is defined in terms of the subset relation, then we can see that z is worst, right? Y is best. X and v are sort of in the middle but not comparable to each other because it's, they are not subsets of each, of either way, right? There's no subset relation here. So we have y being better than uh, these and b, right? So this is the order of worlds that we get Okay. So, so far we only have the ordering relation. We don't yet have a truth definition for universal statements. But that will now, you can see already uh, what the intuition is, that will refer to this ordering relation. Because now she wants to say, Kratzer wants to say that a necessity model here and then quantifies only over these guys, there may of course be more than one, right? And then it says that the sentence like this is the road to Springfield is true at all of these and the other ones are not, not relevant. Uh, well, this is here, uh, this must be the road to Springfield. This is, as I said, right? Uh, most likely to be an epistemic model. It has to do with likelihood, given what you think, right? So then the ordering source is, uh, has to have a collection of those propositions that somehow have to do with, uh, well, the normal course of events, what no what's normally the case, something like that. So you cannot rule out, you, you don't know, literally, that this is the road, okay? But under the usual assumptions, you know, it leads in the right direction, it has traffic on it, and uh, perhaps there is a sign that fell off, but you can still somehow see that it may have said Springfield at some point. All these things together make it likely that it is the road to Springfield. But we haven't ruled out the counterexamples. They are still there. They are still in the model base. Right? You might be wrong, but you think it must be the counterexample, uh, the road to Springfield. 
how can that be possible now? Uh, you know, these two sentences, it, it might not be the road to Springfield, but it must be. Well, it's actually a bit weird to say that, I guess, although you can say things like that. Um, I cannot, it must be the, the road to Springfield, but I can't uh, rule out that I might be wrong, something like that. You can consistently say that because you quantify over two different things here, right? Uh, this uh, claim that it's the road to Springfield refers to only these top guys, but the other claim that, well, it's possible that you're wrong. There are counterexamples in the modal base. That says something about the whole set, or the whole thing here. So, okay, now before, uh, I haven't really, you haven't talked about the definition for these, um, these models, because it's a bit complicated. It's important to first keep the, intro, uh, the um, intuition straight. Uh, you can think of this a bit like, What this does really is add a sense of gravity, right? You have this set in the model base, and when you put, when you apply an ordering source to it, some trickle down and some flow to the top, right? Something like that. Or perhaps it's like a magnet. You hold it there, and then some come, you know, some are more likely than others. But if you have a different, if you come from a different direction, then the whole set of worlds presents itself differently. Okay. So depending on what your ordering source is, you get different directions of these arrows. Okay. That's the basic idea. For the same model base, you can now uh, look at different subsets of it and get quite different truth values for the same sentence depending on which ordering source is involved. Maybe true with respect to one and false with respect to another. And which one it is depends on the context of it's a pragmatic factor. A linguistically interesting question is then, of course, uh, which modal expressions go with which ordering sources? It's not our job as linguists to say for any given use of a modal which ordering source it was. You only need to say which it might have been, right? Certain things are impossible. But so th that, is, that is a different topic that uh, is sort of the next step. Here we are only concerned with the basic workings of this framework. Any questions? Not right now, but maybe later. Uh, come uh, ask any time, okay? I think the basic intuition is not so hard. What is a bit tricky is the definition that she actually gives for these, what she now calls <coughs> human necessity. It's a, it's a quaint term, human necessity. Uh, it's this weak kind of necessity that you get. So we have a simple necessity as truth at all possible worlds in the modal base. Now what she calls human necessity is this uh, well, this somewhat more subjective notion, right? More context-dependent dependent notion of necessity. Truth with, with respect to the worlds that are currently under discussion, right? Some subset of the model base. And, uh, okay, she has several quantifiers in that definition. So, I'll write it down, I guess. I'll write it on the board. Uh, 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 uh. This is on page four on my handout. It's also in a paper somewhere. Just, I think uh, this is really exactly how she has it in the paper. Okay, so P is a human necessity in W, right, with respect to some modal base F and ordering source G. Okay, we, all, we know all these things by now. If and only if there is now this, this condition that comes in two clauses. Two things must be the case, okay? Uh, for all worlds in the modal base, right? for all worlds U in this, here, in this white area, 
there is a V. Okay, so for all you in the modal base, there is a V in the modal base. In the modal base, such that V is at least as good uh, as you. <coughs> and then another thing for all Z in the modal base. Okay, I'll write this down first. It's a bit long. V then Z is an element of P. Um, when we read these things, just keep in mind, some people find this confusing, uh, keep in mind that um, an expression, a statement of this kind here, means that V is more than you, right, in a sense. Uh, intuitively, that's really what we like. Uh, it's, it, it verifies more of these propositions than you. Remember that that was actually uh, at least as many, or the, uh, the, the same ones as you, and maybe some more. That's literally what it means. Uh, so uh, you might wonder, why doesn't the thing go the other way, right? Well, because you can also think about it as a measure of perhaps uh, distance, comparative distance from the ideal. So it's closer, okay? It's not as not as far-fetched or not as bad as you. If you think about it in those terms, then it should make sense. Ah, okay, but what does it say here? So for every world in there, there is a world that's at least as good or normal or likely and such that, well, and you get another quantifier here. This is sort of annoying, but um, uh, I already told you what the basic intuition is, that you want to quantify only over the most, uh, the, the, sort of the best worlds in here, right? The set of the, uh, the minimal elements with respect to this order, right? Um, so why don't you just say that? Well, because, well, for it's basically for technical reasons. If you have infinitely many worlds in this mortal base, which is of course possible, right? There are uncountably many worlds. And also infinitely many propositions in here, in the ordering source, then there may not be a closest or a best world, or not even a set of best worlds, you may, you know, maybe, you know, it's like from mathematics, you know, limits, right? When you approach something, you get closer and closer, but you don't quite reach it. Wherever you are, there's something between you and the thing you want to get to. Likewise here, it's, it's possible that you can never really reach the edge of this, because there will always be some worlds between you and that. That's for, for mathematical reasons, right, basically. And if that's the case, you cannot say the closest worlds because you don't know which ones they are. They don't exist. There will always, for, every, for any world you pick, there may be one between it and the ideal. And you can take that one, there will be another one between that and the ideal, and so on. So that's why you need some, something like this here, a, a slightly more complicated definition which says, um, if you start out somewhere, for all you, if you pick some world U in here, okay, um, and you travel towards this ideal, then at some point you will have only p worlds between you and the ideal, something like that. So you will enter p territory and never leave it at some point, right, as you approach this. 
So P, P is true at all of these worlds. That's, it's still about the same thing what it says, but uh, for these technical reasons it has, well, what I just said explains why you have this quantifier here. And then there is another um, reason for having the existential up there, which has to do with the properties of the, uh, of the relation. It's a bit, well, it's a bit tricky too, so you may have you know, you have this. You have this ideal, and the modal base. Now, I'm, I'm only drawing pictures. I'm not going through this in mathematical terms. But the modal base may intuitively look like something like this. Um, the classes of worlds within which you have this order, but which are mutually incomparable, okay. Well, then you want to say that wherever you start, uh, you can do this. So for, for any U, uh, there will be a V that's at least as good as it. Okay, now this also works in the finite case. <coughs> if you have finitely many worlds in the modal base, you can convince yourself of that. Again, this will then pick out the most ideal ones, and you have a set which is actually has a property. And then this definition is true, or this clause is true, if and only if all of those verify the sentence. Uh, yeah. So you know, if you have suppose, suppose you have um, x and y up here, and then there are other worlds w, w prime, w blah 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 blah, and the order holds between all of these, but not between x and y. Uh, you want to make sure that the sentence is, uh, the, that the, the condition is false when x has um, falsifies p and y verifies it. And you have to take care of all these cases. I would like to not go through that any further. Uh, why you have exactly the form? Do you see why it works? What it does? Into it? Pick some, some arbitrary world, and you know there will be a way of approaching the ideal, and moreover, one in, uh, which has to lead you into P territory the closer you get. Right? Um, okay. Yeah, that is the, uh, the idea behind this. And the, the whole purpose of it is to make sure that here we, are make, we, we say that at the edge of this closest worlds verify P. I actually have something here, you may read through this later on. Uh, why so complicated on page four? Um, I may have said something more about that here. And uh, we can think about. It. We can also talk about this outside of the lectures if you're interested. Why? Why the definition has this form and nothing else? Okay. Um, is that good so far? Uh, and once we have that, did not what what was called human necessity, right? In the analysis of this, it must be the wrote the Springfield sentence. That is now mm. analyzed in these terms, right? So before I said it doesn't really make sense to say that this must be the road to Springfield universally quantifies over all the worlds in your epistemic model base because you usually use that sentence when you are not quite sure. But you also use it when you are 
pretty sure, right? All but certain, in some sense. How? Well, when you have, when your worlds, you know, all the worlds that are in your model base are, that you consider possibilities, um, when they are ranked according to some criterion, likelihood, something like that, right? I'm, I'm saying something like that because it may actually, you may get a deontic reading for this must be the road to Springfield, but it's a bit hard. You can only get that if, you, if you're talking about uh, planning, the planning stage when you're, when you're standing at the map and you say, okay, this road is, must go to Springfield. This ought to go to Springfield. Uh, and then you build that road so that it goes to Springfield. So there are other readings, but it's usually used in this likelihood sense. So the most normal worlds in your modal base are ones in which this is road to Springfield. And the word must, so that's, this is the only change that is made here to the uh, semantic account. The word must would then simply refer to this human possibility and not the other, the you know, simple possibility. And you get all these things, right? Uh, the, the weakness of the, of the assertion that it makes. You get that as a result of making that simple change. Um, now it's not so clear that that accounts for everything that must does. So that must is a tricky word. Uh, you know, in, uh, you, you can have two epistemic sentences. This will be the road to Springfield, to S. You can use will in this completely non-temporal sense, as you probably know. Um, I think this is the road to Springfield. You can also have this should be the road to Springfield in an epistemic sense, not deontic. Right. You may have, you can have uh, must. All, all these three, somehow they are all weak but necessity models, right? They are all of the same kind. What I just explained with relation with regard to must also applies to these. And then of course the question is, what are the differences between them, if any? Well, I don't know, no one knows. This is an open question. People write papers on this, but um, very few and no, we don't know it right now. Uh, the, so whatever the difference is, it probably does not involve, according to Kratzer at least, does not involve the, uh, the way the truth is determined with regard to some ordering source. It may rather be that uh, some of them go with one kind of ordering source and the others go with some other kind of ordering source. So, but once you have that fixed, the truth is determined in the same way. The, uh, the modal statement itself remains the same, right, at this abstract level. And then the, world, the words, they select for certain readings. Maybe that's the explanation. Maybe that's, maybe that's the key to explaining the difference between these three. Currently, we don't know what the difference is, really. At least, well, we cannot encode that, represent it in the model in a reasonably clear way. So for graded modality, you can just stay with this example and think of other ways of hedging it, you know, modifying this assertion, weakening the claim. This is probably the road to Springfield. Maybe, might be. There is a good possibility. What, this is what it's, what's in the paper, in the handout, right? There's a good possibility um, that is the road to Springfield, and so on. So, in, okay. So we have the um, human necessity defined in these terms, right? 
So human necessity, or well, it's just erased, basically, right? This Greek version of necessity up here. Then uh, we are also given this human possibility. These other things are now defined in terms of the ones that we already know, right? So P is a human possibility. Uh, if not P is not a human necessity, Now this time you actually get uh, a somewhat stronger reading for this uh, possibility, don't you? What do you think? Um, well, let's let's talk about this when we have the full picture here. The uh, the other two things, right? There's also what is here called a slight possibility, right? So presumably there is a difference between these two, right? Slight possibility and what is called human possibility, which says that not P is a human necessity. Not P is human necessity and, or but, P is it says compatible with the modal base, which is just to say that it is a simple possibility. Where the simple possibility is what we actually had with the diamond, right? How do these two differ? It's, it's pretty clear now that this human possibility is a stronger requirement than slight possibility, because what this one says is that you have p worlds among the most likely ones, right? Not all the ideal ones are p worlds. Oh, not p. Not all the ideal ones are not p worlds. There are some p worlds at the edges of this here that satisfy just as many of the propositions in the ordering source as any of the p-worlds. Well, you know, then the, you know the, that's a pretty strong requirement, whereas the slight possibility just says, uh, well, p is a human necessity. Sorry, that's not p. All of these are not p-worlds, but there are p-worlds back here. That is, you cannot completely rule p out, but you don't think p is true, OK? Also, with permissions, you can think of ways of um, making sense of this. Uh, you know, there may be two things you, you can choose to do. You may, you may um, stay home or come to work. If your boss tells you that explicitly, yeah, that you have these two choices, um, you probably assume that both of them are okay with regard to the rules, right? Both of them are 